Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about a case, the Queen and Coven. This is an interesting case because it deals with how the court should handle broken firearms. This case is also sometimes cited as the Queen and Coven and Coven because there are two Covens, they're brothers. Let's have a look at the case. As you can see, this is a 1983 Supreme Court of Canada decision. It's still good law, it's still cited. It's, uh, this is very much the law of the land. Skip ahead here to the beginning of the reasons. The two respondents, the Coven brothers, committed a holdup in a credit union using a carbon dioxide pistol. They were charged with and convicted of robbery, but also under section 83 of the criminal code with the use of a firearm during the commission of an offense, punishable in the case of a first offense by a minimum sentence of imprisonment of not less than one year to be served consecutively to any other punishment imposed for an offense arising out of the same event. If you're not quite sure what's going on here, what that means is that if they're convicted on the use of a firearm in the commission of an offense, the minimum sentence they're looking at here is a one-year punishment that's served consecutively. That means after the uh, punishment for the same offense. So this is a, effectively a bonus sentence of a year. Often in Canadian law, sentences can be served concurrently, which means that they're served at the same time. The difference there is, let's say you get a six-month sentence on one offense and a six-month sentence on the other offense. If they're served concurrently, you're going to be in custody for six months minus whatever other factors. Whereas if they're served consecutively, that six months is added to the six months and it becomes a year. I can go into why and how that applies uh, most of the time in another video, but for right now, we'll just uh, just be aware that that's what's at stake here is an extra year in, in custody. The Court of Appeal quashed their conviction for this latter offense, finding that although the carbon dioxide pistol did constitute a weapon or imitation thereof for the purpose of the robbery count, a jury could not on the evidence have reasonably concluded that it was a firearm within the definition in the code. The sole issue before this court is whether the Court of Appeal erred in so finding. The factual setting of the issue is found in the testimony of a forensic firearm examiner for the RCMP who testified at trial that the weapon was an air pistol in damaged and incomplete condition. There were 14 parts of the gun missing or damaged, and seven of those missing parts were essential to its operation. The witness said further that an experienced person could replace the missing parts in 10 to 15 minutes. And that's, of course, assuming that you have the parts. There are two relevant sections in this appeal. One, the everyone who uses a firearm, A, while committing or attempting to commit an indictable offense, or B, during his flight after committing or attempting to commit an indictable offense, whether or not he means or causes or means to cause bodily harm to any person as a result thereof, is guilty of an indictable offense and is liable to imprisonment. And in the case of a first offense under this subsection, except as provided under in paragraph D, for not more than 14 years and not less than one year. Two, a sentence imposed for, on a person for an offense under subsection 1 shall be served consecutively to any other punishment imposed on him for an offense arising out of the same event or series of events, and to any other sentence to which he is subject at the time the sentence is imposed on him for an offense under subsection 1. The other section is, for the purposes of this part, firearm means any barreled weapon from which any shot, bullet, or other missile can be discharged, and that is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death to a person, and includes any frame or receiver of such a barreled weapon, and anything that can be adapted for use as a firearm. So the court here is going to really have to get into that definition, because that's going to be key to this particular case. When reading the definition of firearm, it first appears that what is print being principally considered is a barreled weapon that is actually capable of causing serious bodily injury or death because it can be loaded and fired. This to me includes unloaded guns for reasons I will give shortly. It is apparent that the section extends the definition of firearm to include anything that has the potential of becoming a firearm through adaptation. This section goes on to extend that category to include frames and receivers and by reason thereof the section when read literally, at least in its English version, includes these frames and receivers irrespective of their adaptability. This would mean that even firearms inoperative because uh, beyond repair, 
would still be firearms in as much as there was a frame or receiver. One might then wonder, if such is the case, why an operative firearms needed any qualification in the section, in as much as the frame or the receiver was present. In the French version of the definition, it is apparent that frames and receivers are mentioned as considered illustrative of those things adaptable for use as a firearm. I have, for the benefit of those whose understanding of French is limited, translated more or less literally the French version of the definition. I'm going to skip over reading the French because my accent is probably terrible, but here is their sort of rough translation. Firearm means any weapon, including the frame or chamber of such a weapon, and anything that can be adapted to be used as such that is capable because of a barrel from which shot bullets or any other missile can be discharged of causing serious bodily injury or death to a person. The French version is not without its own difficulties, but as I said, I believe the central idea is more easily perceived and frames and receivers must eventually meet the test of adaptability to becoming dangerous weapons. That's an important point here. Another difficulty is that of remoteness. Indeed, most pieces of metal, pipe, or wood can, given time, tools, and expertise, be said to be adaptable for use as a firearm, that is, becoming capable of being loaded and fired in such a way as to cause bodily injury. And this makes sense. If you think about it, a person without a great deal of skill can assemble a functional shotgun out of a couple lengths of pipe, an end cap, a nail, and that's about it. You don't need a whole lot of parts. So just with the stuff you can get at a Home Depot, you can build a firearm, assuming that you've got minimal levels of skill. I'm not going to walk anyone through how that's done, but it's fairly apparent. So the question is, if you own a Home Depot or a hardware store, do you also own a firearm? Court's going to have to get to that. So that's sort of what they're talking about here. In my view, the acceptable amount of adaptation and the time required, therefore, is, uh, or therefore, for something to still remain within the definition is dependent upon the nature of the offense wherein the definition is involved. The purpose of each section should be identified and the amount, nature, and time span for adaptation determined so as to support Parliament's endeavor when enacting that given section. What they're saying here is that depending on the offense you're alleged to have been committing, the time frame for how long it takes to adapt something into a firearm is going to vary. Well, they'll get into that a little bit more and I can provide some more explanation once they do. The offense we are considering in this case is the use of a firearm during the commission of, an of, of another offense. The purpose of section 83 is to protect the victim of the commission of an offense from serious injury or death by discouraging through mandatory consecutive imprisonment used by him who commits the offense of a firearm that is capable of being fired. It has been said that section 83 is not only aimed at preventing physical injury, but also at preventing the cause of alarm. See the Queen in Bel Air. With respect, I do not agree. Had that been the section's purpose, Parliament would have included imitations of firearms as it did in section 85 or again in section 302 of the code. Therefore, whatever is used on the scene of the crime must, in my view, be pr proven by the Crown as capable, either at the outset or through adaptation or assembly, of being loaded and fired and thereby having the potential of causing serious bodily harm during the commission of the offence or during the flight after the commission of that main offence, the hold-up. An operable but unloaded pistol or revolver or air pistol is a firearm, because it is capable during the commission of the offense, when loaded and fired, of causing bodily injury. See the Queen in Bruyard. Uh, if inoperable, then as regards section 83, it is a firearm if, given the nature of the repairs or modifications required, and the availability of the parts on the scene, whatever was used could, during the commission of the offense, have been adapted by an ordinary person or by the accused if possessing special skills to be or so as to be capable of firing and of causing serious injury. Note that the test there is kind of uh, kind of includes a little hook if you happen to be an experienced gun owner or in particular an experienced gunsmith because if they can prove if the crown is able to prove that you have special skills that might make you better than the average person 
at assembling a firearm that you can actually be held to a higher standard. Something is more likely to be a gun in your hands than it is in the hands of an ordinary person. But you also note that the minimum standard here is that of an ordinary person. So if you, for some reason, are specially enable to, you know, to handle firearms, if we pick a somewhat, you know, unusual example of somebody who was disabled and had no hands and thus was unable to sort of handle the, uh, the assembly of the firearm, they're still held to the standard of an ordinary person. That's uh, neither here nor there. The burden is upon the Crown to prove this. Because the section does not require that the accused be in possession of ammunition at the time of the offense, a weapon falling within the definition of Section 82 is, for the purposes of Section 83, a weapon whether or not the accused has the necessary ammunition to fire it. Parliament has relaxed that burden as regards proof of the presence of ammunition at the time of the offense. Indeed, except in cases where the gun was actually fired, the Crown would practically never, uh, be, never have been able to meet proof of that fact. But to this extent, only has Parliament reduced the burden of proof. I am not unmindful of the burden of proof placed on the Crown. But one must not lose sight of the fact that Parliament is penalizing additionally the use of a firearm, even in cases where its use was, qua, qua an offensive weapon, an essential component of the main offense. This is really obnoxious writing, but uh, oh, thankfully the courts have sort of gotten out of this trend of uh, unusual sentence construction and unnecessary Latin. The fact that the Crown has to meet this burden is understandable when considering that there is a mandatory jail sentence of at least one year added to the sentence imposed for the main offense. In the present appeals, there is no evidence that there was at the time and place of the offense or during the flight thereafter, to use the words of Hart in The Queen and Haynes, the necessary ingredients for an operable firearm together with the ability to place it in operable form. So they dismissed the appeals and the Coven brothers were convicted of the robbery, but they didn't get this extra one year for the firearm because the firearm couldn't be proved to be operable. Note here the little bit about the time frame of the offense. And let's think about that one a little bit because it actually functions in a way that maybe is a little counterintuitive and maybe, maybe not the way you or I might design the legislation. Because in the course of this robbery, a robbery is by necessity a fairly short time. And it's a fairly short time where you don't really have a whole lot of free time. You know, if you're holding up a bank, nobody's going to let you say, hold on, time out. I need 15 minutes to assemble my gun. Just wait here, wait a second, I'm, I'm going to build this gun. You're going to get hit with a chair. You know, somebody's going to intervene if you've, you know, if you're sitting there dismantling your gun and it's going to be obvious that you are not armed with something sort of effective at that point and they're going to take the time to uh, to intervene. But if you think of some of the uh, the less serious scenarios, and I say less serious not to minimize, but they are there are serious are scenarios that are less serious and scenarios that are more serious. And one that occurs to me here is just simple uh, careless storage of a firearm or storage of a firearm contrary to regulations because the storage aspect of a firearm is going to be something that takes place over some time. It's not going to be something that happens in, you know, 15 minutes or five minutes. That's going to be something that takes place over weeks. And so it's actually easier to be convicted for possession of a broken firearm if you're talking about, you know, careless storage or possession of the firearm without a license, any of these sorts of things that maybe, you know, a farmer who isn't sort of out robbing banks, but also isn't necessarily the most careful with their firearms, you know, this sort of individual who isn't a criminal, but also isn't necessarily following the rules, they're a lot more likely to be convicted than the bank robber. That isn't really how I'd try to design the rules. I'd be thinking that it should work the other way around, that the bank robber is more likely to get convicted than the farmer. 
but that's the that's the way the Supreme Court decided here. And let me know in the comments if that's something you agree with. Uh, let me know in the comments if you think that these individuals should have been convicted specifically on the firearm count, given that it's a broken air pistol. Uh, I'll cover in another video the case of the Queen and Dunn, which deals with when an air pistol counts as a firearm. I'll probably do another separate video uh, covering how air pistols are handled in the law because that's fairly complicated. But let me know what you think. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. I have also left a link to the, the case here as well as to my Patreon below. I'd like to thank my $10 Patreon subscribers and their name is going to be on the panel immediately following. Thank you.